April 12th. Uh, another week begins with prices a little bit softer, dropping on the open in Asia. I mean, opening, sorry, up a little bit as we have in our headline. Since we wrote our headlines an hour or two ago, prices have come off and they're down a little bit. So ultimately, little change, moving sideways, as I would call it. Let's kick off with regular Monday morning commentator Omar Najia, Global Head of Derivatives for BB Energy. Omar, the market seems to be stuck for direction at the moment. Um, well, I mean, uh, the the market has like three directions. Usually it's misconstrued as either up or down. But sideways is another direction. So you actually have three. So basically what it's doing is it's moving sideways, which is uh, not very helpful to people who want to sell or buy it. Uh, because it's not doing much. Uh, but the bottom line is the more sideways it moves, the more kind of energy it stores for, it, for its next uh, break, um, either higher or lower. <clears throat> the problem is right now with crude, it's the, least, um, it's the least one that's giving any clues as to when it wants to actually uh, move uh, higher or lower. But if you look at the other markets, if you look at the S&P, that's strongly uh, up and I think is going to continue strongly up. If you look at Bitcoin, that's also above 60,000 now. So again, that's strongly up. Um, the dollar is not doing very much. So um, I, would, I would say if we can maintain this, uh, if we can stay where we are, if we don't drop below 58.12 basis WTI, then I think higher. If we break that fifty-eight twelve, we we might need uh, we might need to move a little lower for a, for a week or two. Lori Hatayan, Mina Director, Natural Resource Governance Institute. Lori, welcome back to the table. It uh, it seems that the talks in uh, Vienna, the Iran, uh, U.S., and the Permanent Five uh, with the the discussions to. Uh, restart the Iran nuclear agreement, in of itself has some weight on this market, the outcome of which could be either bullish or bearish. Your thoughts on, on, on the direction of those talks? So, well, first of all, let's say that, as everybody knows, that already Iran is exporting, yes, to China and to other places. And the issue is, like, if these, uh, if the uh, uh, um, uh, talks are, uh, are successful, how much they can bring back and how fast they can bring back. So what we are seeing currently, it's like you have two, uh, two uh, tracks going on in this negotiation. One, you have the official one where Iran, Iran, the US are trying to find any table where they can sit all over the table or around the table to pretend that they are discussing things. On the other track, you have the Israelis attacking the Iranian sites Okay, and the horses are attacking the, the, the Saudi Arabia. So these two tracks are interlinked. And that's why we see that for now, at least, we don't see any breakthrough. I think what we will see that until the elections in Iran, we will keep on having these, like all these goodwill uh, statements that we want to uh, negotiate. Yes, you go first, I go first, you remove the sanctions. No, I don't remove the sanctions, etc. all of that. At the same time, you will have these, uh, the the Houthi Israeli attack track and the and as much as Iran can uh, keep on uh, exporting in different ways they will do that until we reach to a place where we really have an official uh, an official uh, uh, deal and where uh, Iran might be able to come back so I don't see uh, like any changes to this eight hundred thousand or maybe one million until end of year, I don't unless something uh, unexpected happens, but I don't see anything be, beyond one million coming back from Iran. Adi Msirovich, senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Adi, is it just finally the moment when everybody's woken up to the king has no clothes, so to speak, in the sense that? Oh my God, there's 8 million barrels of idle supply. There is no shortage of oil anywhere. And despite maybe Bitcoin's going crazy because there's a shortage of Bitcoin, I don't know. You know, Tesla cars are worth a fortune because maybe, you know, electric cars are going to be doing something. But ultimately, oil, there's just too much of it around. These prices should be happy in the low 60s. Morning, Sean. Morning, everyone from um, um, snowy England. It's snowing oh, wow. pretty hard, oh. actually. 
That's interesting. Yes. <clears throat> it, it looked like Christmas. Anyway. Um, Except it's yes, mid-April. Um, it's in April. I know, mid-April as well. Um, very, very good point, Sean. Um, yes, there's always this dichotomy between the sort of, you know, what we call paper markets and the physical markets. Physical markets have just gone through a bit of a speed bump. Uh, in fact, the physical markets still look rather weak, um, even though there are a lot of signs of the markets picking up. Data this week, the front spreads have been weak, and particularly the, um, the, the differentials have been very, very weak. There's still a lot of uh, unsold West African oil, even though India scooped up quite a bit recently last week. Um, it, 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 there's plenty of oil around, you're absolutely right. But let's not forget that what the when we talk about the flat price in oil, we're talking about forward markets. We're talking about already close to July. So that's Q going into Q3, Q4. And most people that trade those markets, they look at the balances out there. And balance is actually looking very, very good. Let's not forget that recently we've had, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, IMF report pointing out that China should be growing this year almost 8.5%. United States should be growing about 6.4%. Even UK will be growing 5.3%, according to the IMF. So that's what the people who trade paper market are looking at. They're looking at forward numbers. And that's why the S&P is high. That's why the Bitcoin is high, because we are seeing the sort of results of all these stimulus measures and the pent up demand coming back into the market. We are looking forward. I, I do think that uh, assuming that OPEC plus keep their discipline, I think this market has a very, very good chance to go higher. Uh, in the meantime, obviously, as, as, you've, um, as you've mentioned early on um, with, um, with Laurie and, and Omar, you know, with Iran negotiations, Iran, I agree with Laurie completely. I think even if Iran comes back into the market, I think the, the, the volumes are going to be relatively modest. And they will probably then, if, if there is an agreement, be sold at the market price rather than discounted prices right now. So the market is not looking bad at all. We, we do see a speed bump at the moment. We're still going through the volumes, but we think that actually OECD stocks may actually uh, go back to our five-year averages by Q3. So we are almost back to normal in a few months' time, if all things equal. Omar, um, I'm not sure if you dropped off there, but I can't see your phone. There you are. Um, the... In in the midst of all of this sort of uh, demand outlook that Adi has 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 pointed towards, there, uh, obviously we're talking uh, about the, uh, America, China, still very positive. Uh, what kind of a uh, relative impact or significance for that paper market second half of the year is it that we're seeing india with record infection levels brazil and these other fairly significantly large emerging economies clearly not uh, on the scale of china or the us and so forth but still when you add them all together a significant amount of the the demand side i'm wondering as you calculate the second half of the year how significant this those countries and the delay that they will have or the potential impact on the uh, upward momentum that price could have um, okay, so so in general, you have a world where you have massive stimulus. You have a world where basically vaccines are being rolled out, so the risk of corona decreases. Uh, you have basically, you know, people coming out of lockdowns, economies coming out of lockdowns. Um, China, basically, car sales were like massively up. I was reading on uh, Zero Hedge, like 64%, but I didn't read uh, what month or year or whatever. Uh, gasoline demand in the U.S. is surging. Uh, you know, they're looking at um, uh, airlines and people will fly or will they drive or, you know, Powell was saying the, you know, the Fed. Um, yeah, I don't we've know all of that. I mean, the, demands, the demand recovery in the major economies is, is clearly forecast. But in the emerging economies, the Brazils, the Indias and the others, uh, who have real challenges still uh, with the COVID pandemic, does that in any way suppress the outlook? Uh, maybe the risk, this demand recovery is delayed by three months or, or whatever. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the goal is to get on the right side of the market. The goal is basically you are either long or short, right? The goal is not 
will I be long, you know, three months now? Right. Or shall I wait a little bit or whatever? You've got to make a decision now. You're either in it or right. you're not. You're either right. short or you're long. So basically people are not going to look at all this nuanced, you know, when will the, you know, COVID situation in India improve? No, no, they're looking at global things. So globally, China's past the finish line, like Adi was saying, grown 8%. Everybody's coming. You know, the U.S. is going to grow. For, uh, the Europe's going to grow, maybe least of all. Uh, you know, everybody's going to grow. The question is, by how much? So China's past the finish line. Everybody else is coming. Is that positive or is that negative? It's positive. Uh, and, and the idea that, you know, oil, there's 8 million and there's plenty of oil. Yeah, but, but it's in the wrong place. It's not in the market. You know, that's, that's, what, that, that's what counts. There's a lot of, uh, I, was, I was typing earlier, there's a lot of oil in the world or in the universe. But what matters is what's on the market, right? So spare capacity I, is all I think, great. But, I think you know, what... that's, that, that is, is a challenge, Laurie. Ultimately, I take Omar's point, you know, you're either long or you're long. But on the front end of this market, we are to a certain extent in a race against time here in that uh, how long can OPEC Plus keep this fabricated market elevated through discipline before this infamous demand recovery comes rising over the hill with the cavalry. Uh, ultimately, this is a race against time. And how many more barrels does Saudi need to cut unilaterally to keep the pillars in the, in, in the castle uh, up? So that's my question. There's no doubt the long is the long, but how long can OPEC keep this together? Well, for OPEC, at least before OPEC Plus, this is very important to control the prices because they need to have control over prices because it affects directly their economies. And now if we're talking about economic recovery and for economies that are based, all their economy is based on oil and gas money. So they need to have control over that. So, they, but as long as, but in, in, as, time, as time goes on and you, you have to then bargain uh, with OPEC plus, so with the Russians and the rest on how to really control this thing and not to depart and keep the, uh, the harmony and keep this understanding between them. And this is where it becomes difficult. And then this is where we would see uh, bargaining. Uh, I give you this, you give me that, you support me in this, I support you in that. So it might go like broader than just the fixation that they are in now that we need to keep the prices to a level that is good for everybody, especially for the uh, for the uh, oil producing countries that completely rely on uh, oil and gas so that uh, that is very important and i think until now this was very they understood that it is important to control the prices it is important to have like a, a price that is good for the economies that will not be devastating and that now they need to have it, the longer period they keep this understanding, it's better for them so that they recover from the devastating results from last year, because now it's the recovery. So it's for recovery, it's vaccination, yes, it's money as well, because you need money to do whatever you need to do for your uh, recovery. So I think uh, it, they will continue doing whatever they can and be patient. And I think Saudi Arabia will pay, play an important role to, on keeping everybody together until they're out of the tunnel. Adi, your thoughts on that same question and also the point that OPEC Plus in their last agreement did give us this sort of three month guideline, uh, but yet meeting every month. And, and just as a caveat, we have a story in the digest today uh, reporting on increased production out of the US in the last quarter, oil production activity across the US Great Plains and Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. states rose uh, in the last quarter. Your thoughts? Yes, Sean. Uh, I'll just start from, from, the, from, from the end of your question. It's quite yeah. interesting, actually, to see that um, the, the, these additional volumes or the, the prompt volumes of the U.S. crude are actually offered in Europe right now by the two Chinese companies. Um, <laughs> it's, that's trading for you. Um, anyway, um, going back to, the, um, uh, to, to your question, I, I, think, I think I agree with Laurie. I think um, you know, uh, we, this is anniversary of, of, of uh, the shock last year, right? And I think it's still reasonably fresh in people's memories. So I think most producers would actually think about, think twice before they actually um, uh, break that discipline of OPEC+. Plus. I think but one OPEC has to acknowledge, sorry, I didn't interrupt, 
that discipline of OPEC plus is already breaking. I mean, it there is a, a, a big headline, Saudi Arabia compliance at 150%, disguising a lot of water cracks in, in the plaster. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they look, uh, Sean, this OPEC plus, I mean, it's, it's been very hard for OPEC to keep discipline. For OPEC plus, it's that much harder. And that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a very interesting alliance of so many different countries with different policies, with different uh, fiscal needs and so on. So it's, it's going to be very, very hard to keep together. Uh, but let's, let's remember this from the start was the demand shock. And it does remi remi uh, re remain the demand shock. So OPEC's always been strong in a strong market and weak in a weak market. It very much, I think it's a function of what demand overall turns out to be. And I think if we do see what we are seeing right now, balances that we are going to draw almost one and a half million barrels a day for the rest of this year or average this year, I think all, you know, the, the, the alliance will probably kind of stay, all, all, those, all those cracks will be plastered up by the demand increases and that will sort of be very hard to see. So you'll kind of manage to keep that discipline. I think the problem is if we see another wave in the United States, for example, if India gets worse than it has been, if something else happens in China, I think, I think it'll be very, very hard to keep that alliance. But so far, I think it's very, I, 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 there's very little to reason to believe that they will just break apart. I think demand is looking too good for that to happen. Sorry, Adi, I don't know if it's me, but your your connection is a little bit, uh, maybe it's mine, I uh, I don't know. But I, I lost the end of that last statement. Omar, well, just to, to flick across, Omar, on the other issues that playing the, the US dollar, what's its impact, relevance, uh, and, and anything else that might give direction to this market, whether to go down or up? Sorry, Omar, you're on mute. So I, I'm, I don't really believe that there is a correlation between the, uh, the US dollar and, uh, and oil. Um, you can look at it daily, weekly, monthly, or whenever. It, it's, it's not correlated. Um, so um, again, I think you need to look at, you need to look at other markets. Um, you need to look at equities. You need to look at risky assets like Bitcoin. Um, and that's that's what you've got to kind of uh, take a look at to kind of give you a, a clue. But again, you know, I like to think about things uh, as simply as possible and not get into all the kind of, you know, minute, minute uh, of everything. But the bottom line is, you know, things are improving, economies are growing, uh, things will continue to rise. The reason is that the, the question is, do you want to be, are you like a superhero? You're going to stand in front of everything and say no. You know, things might happen in India. Go ahead. I think basically you're going to get steamrolled. Um, so, so the question, the, the question, the question is, though is, what is a fair price for oil in a healthy economic market? I mean, pre-COVID, sixty dollars seemed like a good price. No, it's 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 not about a fair price. Nothing is nothing is about fair anything. I mean, you know, what's the fair price of the U.S. dollar? What's the fair price of Bitcoin or gold? That's not how markets work. They don't work on fair. They work on basically supply demand sentiment, right? How high can we take it, or how low can we take it? So when the market's weak, they took it to minus forty. I guarantee you, if this market is strong, they're going to take WTI ten dollars higher from where it is now, and they're going to take it in your face, and they're going to do the same thing with cocoa and corn, and Bitcoin and everything else until basically everybody keeps saying it's not possible, it's impossible. But look how many barrels are off the market. Yeah, but what's look it going to do this week? We're not talking about you know. We want to get a sense of where we're going on the front if, end. Yeah, on the front end, you need to be. You're either basically positive on sentiment about everything or not. If you are not, you should be selling this market. If you are, and I am, you should be buying it. So I'd belong, I'd belong oil, I'd belong the S&P, and I'd belong Bitcoin. And I'd belong them for a very long time. Laurie, the consequence or not of the talks in Vienna delivering negative or positive outcomes, the, if uh, there's a certain view that this is the last window to revive the Iran nuclear agreement because the elections are coming. 
if this if the moderates lose, the hardliners come in, and it's a whole different ball game. What's your view on that thesis? Uh, the consequence of not rehabilitating this deal before the Iranian elections. Oh, there will always be like new opportunities. And I am a true believer in such situations that the hardliners will make a better deal than the reformists. And, uh, and I, get, I think like going forward after the elections, there will be other opportunities, other windows, other doors that will be knocked open as you want. And, and this will not be over because I think one priority in the Middle East for, for the Biden administration is Iran. It's uh, Israel's security that is like something uh, non, uh, you don't negotiate, you don't discuss or negotiate, it's built in. And then you have the first priority is Iran and the negotiations with Iran. So there, were, there will be other doors, other windows, and it's not going to be over at all. So, but I think now maybe we will keep on until the, uh, until the, um, uh, until the, uh, the elections, uh, we might see these, as I explained in the beginning, maybe some, uh, some uh, 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 cyber attacks, some uh, drone attacks, uh, some uh, uh, positive statements that we want to uh, keep, uh, keep the negotiations uh, open, etc. You know now it's Ramadan and after Ramadan, there will have the elections. So I think in these couple of weeks, hopefully in these couple of months, nothing drastic will happen, like something like an attack that will cause like other uh, violent actions and reactions. So if, if, if everything is kept under control, I think we will end up like going to the table. Well, well if that's the case, if Iranian that's the case, government. why are they going? What's the urgency of a deal here? I mean, there's got to be some sense of urgency or else... They wouldn't be spending very expensive dollars in very expensive Viennese hotels. They like, just go home. No, but because you need to keep this alive. You cannot like... Uh, yeah, but why would you not alive. just wait until J July then and instead of rushing to Vienna now? Don't, don't forget that the Americans don't like uh, the, uh, the comments coming out of Iran saying that they, they, ha they are very close to becoming, to, to, to having this nuclear... Uh, bomb or whatever. So that is very important. That's why they sit on the table with the U.S. At the same time, the Israelis go and attack the Natan's power power uh, uh, site, you know, uh, Natan's uh, nuclear site. You know, this is the kind of thing. And then this, uh, the, the 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 Iranians uh, uh, react to that attack by atta by the forces attacking Saudi Arabia. So this is like the the proxy war that is going on. At the same time not closing the door over uh, the door to negotiations. This will okay. be the dynamics going forward because Adi. everybody got, wants to come back to the table. The Iranians have an interest in coming back because they are suffering economically. The Americans and the Israelis don't want to see a nuclear Iran. Iran. So this is the dynamics that we will keep on seeing. Adi, uh, I haven't had a chance to hear your views on the new Murban contract uh, that has been launched uh, recently in Abu Dhabi, your thoughts on its uh, arrival, its performance, etc. Well, you know, um, I think I've written a, a couple of things on that. Um, Mervyn contract makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there's more and more sort of that sort of quality of oil that's in demand um, in, in the region. And I think with, with all, without going into all the arguments in there, I mean, it has a very, very good chance of succeeding. Um, the, the initial few days were, you know, probably rather poor, but I wouldn't, you know, one shouldn't read too much into that. All of these contracts, I, I traded DME Oman contract from day one and, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's been hard for many, many years. It, it, it's hard to get contracts to work uh, over the long run. Um, Merban will do fine, I'm sure. I think it's welcomed by the trading community. I think it'll be welcomed by LNG traders because that's one of the ways you can you can actually hedge the so-called JCC, Japanese crude cocktail um, uh, exposure, which many uh, LNG traders have. Um, I, what I do think is that the, 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 the talk of Merban overtaking Brent and WTI is way overblown. Uh, it does, that doesn't make any sense, at least for, for a while. Uh, but it, it's very interesting. I think it's most welcome for the tr by the trading community, and I think has a very, very good chance of succeeding. It's another instrument um, in in sort of the uh, armor of uh, oil traders and, and hedges, and I think it's most welcome by the market. What do you think its principal opportunity is, or what problem mm -hmm. does it solve that isn't being solved elsewhere? 
Well, it, it adds, first of all, for all the Mervyn is, is a large production and it's a very popular crew east of Suez. Um, uh, the obvious one is that, you know, this all this um, vest, vestige of the old 86 OPEC price control things is the OSP. Why, why even bother with OSP? Let, let, let the market decide what the OSP. I think that's great. I think it's a great idea. And I think that's probably a, a message for all the other OPEC producers that they may look into it. Uh, secondly, Mervyn is very similar to Russian uh, crudes coming out of the East in terms of quality. It's uh, not dissimilar, it's higher sulfur, but not dissimilar from the US grades coming into Asia from 40s. So it, op, 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 when, when, I, when I traded um, a North Sea, when I looked at the arbitrage into the Asia, I always looked at the value of Mervyn. Uh, so people do look at those values and once they're market related, once you really believe those numbers, I think they're extremely useful. Okay, let's get a survey for the view of the room on the some of the themes we've been talking about this morning. Oil prices are stuck at the low 60s because markets have woken up to the fact that, oh my Lord, there's indeed lots of crude oil available. Agree or disagree uh, on that point? Um, Omar... Wrapping up, looking ahead this week, the uh, is there technical indicators in the market that that if it drops to here, it could go to there. If it goes up to there, it could move on. What's the technical outlook uh, at sure. the moment? Yeah, WTI, if it drops below 58.12, uh, we'll start to look um, we'll start to look negative. Uh, and if it gets, if it, need, it needs to get below 57.25, and then it stands a good chance of getting to, uh, you know, 55, 54, 80, something like that. If it at gets. At the moment, uh, we have WTI at 59, I think. Yeah, 59.03. Yeah. If it manages to get above uh, 60, uh, then it looks good to the upside. If it manages to get above 62.27, I think you're going to see $70. $70. So that's. Uh, that could swing either way. I suppose uh, the the driving season is not far off. Laurie, your thoughts again, calling, reading the tea leaves. We didn't even talk about Ukraine, uh, the Turks sending more soldiers into Libya. Anything else there in the Eastern Med, wider Eastern European geopolitical horizon that has uh, anything to be concerned about? I think like what's happening with Ukraine and Russia is concerning, but again, controlled. I think this is a message to the U.S. If you block Nord Stream 2, I will block uh, Ukraine for you. So this is like you block, I block. So I think this is like how I read it, at least what's happening there. But again, like I do share Blinken's sentiment that this is very serious and we should keep an eye on it. But I guess it's like it would be solved with Nord Stream 2. So that's uh, on the side. And for what's happening between Lib in Libya, actually, it's like this Turkey, Turkey, Egypt rapprochement. Uh, we see that there are like some components related to what's happening to Libya. So Turk, so Egypt is saying yes, we are willing to uh, to come back to talk to you again, but you need to uh, to take real actions and not only like what you're doing in in uh, in Turkey by uh, by appeasing the. Uh, uh, or by, by, by kind of asking the Muslim Brotherhood presence in Turkey to tone it down against Sisi, etc. But again, take action in, in Libya. So, and now there are discussions about removing all the, uh, all the foreign soldiers, etc. So I think this is part of the a new uh, tactics, maybe, of Erdogan. With, the, within that the, point on Libya, do you think the new government is, is solid, that, that the gains that have been made in the last six months are protected? It looks like that, but again, very fragile. Like we don't know like what happens any moment, but what we are seeing and all these discussions about like put, uh, our sending away the, uh, the foreign soldiers, etc. This, uh, this uh, rapprochement between Turkey, uh, Egypt, uh, and the support that the new government is taking, I think it, I think it has a chance. Now, the most important is like for this government to be able to do the elections in December because it, the, the first mandate for them is like to do the election. So hopefully this will not be postponed because it's always, that, that was always the weakest point. They promise to do elections and then they don't never do elections and then we end up with, with the messy situation. So hopefully, and it seems that like uh, oil wise, etc., everything is straightforward now. We don't see any, any, uh, 
disruptions on uh, the oil exports or not. Okay, let's give Adi the last word with the survey result. Um, see what the view in the room agree, disagree, two to one. Uh, Adi, your thoughts on what might happen this week that could give this market some direction? Yes, this week will be interesting uh, primarily from the macro point of view. Um, if you obviously all the stock markets we talk about it at very high levels, um, uh, the S and P currently I, I read um, basically takes into account or expects earnings to be about twenty five percent higher than last year. So wow. now the proof will be in the pudding. So if if we get these earnings, I think they will confirm the strength of the current uh, macro market. And if we get that confirmed, I think the oil is going to to respond quite strongly and pick up. Uh, if we, on the other hand, obviously, if we don't see that macro situation confirmed, I think oil may struggle for a little while. Okay, well, that's some useful tips there. Keep an eye, as Omar said at the top of the show, where S&P is going, where the Bitcoin is going, where the risk appetite is going. And indeed, as people go out and shop and consume, if they're going to make all these companies uh, realize these massive profits. Uh, looks like it will be a bumper summer in the US. What will it look like in Mumbai? Who knows? We'll have to see. Omar, as always, thank you really very much for your insights this morning. Lori, thank you again. Checking in from Beirut and Addy from snowy London. Hopefully that may results in more energy demand. Who knows? The good or bad, uh, nonetheless, uh, we'll take good fortune wherever it comes from. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great week. We'll catch up with you in the coming days. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.